Right. Now that we can get on cracking, thanks for inviting me to share some thoughts with you today. And as you see on your screen, my plan is to talk about a meta scientific review I've conducted on cognitive load lie detection. And what I'll be doing is I'll be getting at the foundations of uh, this idea. Uh, and I'd really like to hear thoughts now or later about lines of reasoning that you reckon speak to or against the issues I'd be raising. Uh, housekeeping note, I think this topic is really tricky to cover. And so for that reason, I have to give a really extensive background to even be able to make sense of the main issues. And I'll cover just enough, hoping that I'll pique your interest. Everything I've got to say on this uh, topic is published open access on Sci Archive and Collabra Psychology, so you can always check it out uh, later. And one last thing, I don't have means and standard deviations. I'm going to just be doing a discussion. Right. So what is cognitive load uh, light detection, right? And the idea is essentially the hypotheses you see on your screen, right? Investigators can exploit the challenge line brings by imposing cognitive load to uh, expose lies. And investigators can uh, impose cognitive load using various interviewing techniques that make answering a question challenging. And some of these interviewing techniques or recommendations, as I call them, include asking folks to report something in reverse temporal order, as opposed to the natural forward order, or by asking people unanticipated questions, or simply asking people to provide more information on uh, some topic. Now, here's essentially an expanded version of uh, the hypothesis, and I'll read a direct quote with some emphasis added. If, a lie, if lying requires more cognitive resources than telling the truth, liars would have fewer cognitive resources left over. And if cognitive demand is further raised, which could be achieved by making additional requests, then liars may not be as good as truth tellers in coping with these additional requests. So let's try and tease apart the implications of this hypothesis. Right? In my opinion, I think this hypothesis invokes a counterfactual, right? The hypothesis is riding on a condition that must first happen. If you do X, Y would happen. If you don't do X, Y would not happen. So if a person is delivering a lie, they would have fewer cognitive resources left over. And if a person is delivering the truth, they're not lying, they would have more resources left over than a liar would. It is this counterfactual that secures the hypothesis, in my opinion. Now, once a difficult question arrives, would-be liars will be starting off with a handicap compared to would-be truth tellers, like I've tried to illustrate on this uh, graph here. Now, essentially, answering a difficult question would price in a challenge that would aggravate things for liars. So liars must contend with two hurdles, right? They must execute the plausible lie and rise to the challenge the question poses. And truth tellers, on the other hand, will be contending just the difficulty of the question. Now, needless to say, there's no specific, there's no specification about percentage points of cognitive load. I'm just using this graph to illustrate things like, like you know, when the rubber meets the road, this is what it should look like. So what is the state of the evidence for cognitive load lie detection? The three relevant meta-analyses on the topic that I could find, four really, but I'll talk about just three. And when you take them together, they suggest to me that we should be a little skeptical of this idea. Let's have a quick look at these meta-analyses. Well, the first one indicates that cognitive load lie detection might be quite effective, right? Cognitive load techniques compared to controls led to an accuracy rate of between 67 to 71%. But the meta-analyses that follow this one don't quite paint the same picture, right? This meta-analysis returned an accuracy rate of 60%, which reduced to 55% after bias correction. And this efficacy rate is ostensibly moderated uh, by when observers know what cues to focus on. But as the authors themselves uh, mentioned over here, uh, this literature is plagued with publication bias and a lack of research on countermeasures. For example, how might people behave to safeguard against, you know, uh, the cognitive load a question might be imposing? And I'll get into this issue a bit more later. And then there's this meta-analysis, which is on reaction times, but I think it gets to the meat of the hypothesis, which found that imposing cognitive load 
handicap through telesability to relay their messages as easily as expected, or as one would expect. Right? Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, well, here comes Dr. No Fun to ruin the party for everybody. I promise you, I, there's an origin story here. I wasn't just looking for trouble with this. So I was going to teach a module on credibility assessment, which includes cognitive load lie detection. So I had to do my due diligence, take nothing for granted, so I can answer questions about the origins and the bases of this hypothesis, given the mixed bag of evidence. So what are the justifications of uh, this hypothesis I'm talking about? And by justification, I mean a derivation chain, right? The network of concepts, assumptions, theoretical mechanisms on which advocates would, you know, stake uh, the cognitive load light detection hypothesis. In plain speak, this is what I mean. Why should we believe in cognitive low light detection, even if the evidence for it is mixed, right? So I went looking for these justifications so I could teach them to my students. Uh, and I've explained what I mean by justification in a general sense. But what does it mean when it comes to cognitive load light detection? Now, the justifications of cognitive load light detection, as I see it, would be the properties of lying that make the behavior demanding to execute and the cognitive load, right? And I think these justifications, they should do two things. Well, one, they should warn the counterfactual that if a difficult question uh, arrives, right, uh, uh, um, uh, would-be liars would be starting off at a handicap if a person decides to lie. And uh, the justification must also warrant the notion that if you impose cognitive load, you would compound that difficulty, right? Essentially, truth tellers answering the question should be tackling a relatively milder challenge, and liars should have a greater challenge when producing their answers, like I've tried to illustrate on screen. So I began to search for these justifications, and I, I kept finding the same list or parts of the same list. And I reckon most of you are familiar with these uh, justifications, but I'll go over them. There are seven of them, at least those I could find, right? And today, I'll tackle the one I've highlighted in green uh, in focus over here. And what I've done with my review is try to examine all the seven justifications and all the possible arguments behind them. And you can read this review later on. But suffice it to say, after reading over the arguments I could find and extrapolating beyond what I, in, uh, to what I think is a reasonable limit, I think this hypothesis is not ready for high, to be tested, right? So the hypothesis, as I see it, suffers from significant underspecification with unknown consequences, right? And what's more concerning is that you can easily miss this underspecification because it's masked by a few blind spots, essentially unanswered research questions and alternative explanations whose consequences we simply don't know. And there are two flavors of these blind spots, and I'll explain them in turn. I call one of them the true tell us underappreciated plight, right? Because the more I delved into these justifications, it became obvious that both true tellers might also face challenges that imposing cognitive load can compound. And I call the other type of research gap the lies potential escape, right? Because one other type of limitation became evident. Liars might not necessarily encounter uh, cognitive load that one can exacerbate, right? Now, these justifications, I think they, these research gaps, they, they point to a complication of note, right? If imposing cognitive load brings the same challenge to lies and truth tellers, uh, imposing cognitive load can bring the same challenge to lies and truth tellers, but in different ways. And let me explain what I mean. I think ignoring the truth tellers plight might erroneously warrant a prediction that inducing cognitive load would make things challenging for lies. But the reality might be that truth tellers also face significant predicaments that cognitive load can compound. And the way I see it, the literature is remarkably silent on how truth tellers might behave under cognitive load. As I've said before, there's that meta-analysis indicating that imposing cognitive load might handicap the expected ease which with uh, people might be able to tell the truth. Right. Let me illustrate the consequence of not taking the truth tellers plight into account. Now, when people are answering questions on the cognitive load, we might think the world looks like this. But that would be wrong if truth tellers are also contending some difficulty we've ignored, right? The world would actually look like this. 
right? And we'll be erroneously expecting true tellers to answer with ease when they are contending some difficulty we have failed to consider. Now let's look at ignore uh, the liar's potential escape. And the assumption here is that liars will be facing some challenge if they choose to lie. But the reality might be the lying comes with no challenge, right? And so when a difficult question arrives, you might think, well, the world looks like this. But that would be wrong when lies are necessarily uh, contending some challenge when they execute their lie, right? And so in answering the question, the world would actually look like this. That would be erroneously expecting uh, that liars would struggle than truth tellers. And in the worst case scenario, there might be a miscarriage of justice because a truth teller might begin to resemble a liar if they can't perform as fluently as we expect. I guess it's time to show my work, right? So I've been yapping about these research gaps for about 11 minutes. And my game here is to angle myself properly so I can illustrate uh, one research gap. And as I said earlier, I'll just do uh, one of them. Everything is on site archive for you to read. So according to this justification, liars versus truth tellers must monitor their lies to remain plausible and consistent, right? Essentially, uh, a liar must ensure that their message aligns with what a receiver knows or might discover, right? And an investigator can exploit this challenge to expose lies. I think this justification doesn't quite account for the truth teller's plight. And I'll try and illustrate this blind spot. Now, a question that becomes immediately obvious is this, what if liars prepared in advance, right? To ensure that their messages are plausible and consistent, right? Arguably that preparation would alleviate the challenge of manufacturing a plausible and consistent message on the spot. And there's some evidence that liars do in fact prepare in some way. But you could easily rebut that argument and say, well, no, sir, the difficulty comes with unanticipated questions, right? In fact, unanticipated questions is one of the main tools to execute cognitive load lie detection. All things being equal, the truth teller knows the information the interviewer is requesting, even if the question is unexpected. So truth tellers should be able to surmount the challenge of being plausible and consistent more easily. But I think this is there's a blind spot here. Let me explain that. It seems reasonable to expect that a neurotypical truth teller would also want to sound plausible and consistent given the risk, right? If you come off as dubious, you would end up on a business end of an investigation, right? And truth tellers might also keep track of their responses to unexpected questions. They would want what they say to align with what the receiver knows or might discover. And in doing so, a truth teller would also aim to be consistent with the things they've already said, like we do in everyday life. A critical question here becomes, well, do liars feel a stronger need to be plausible and consistent than truth tellers do? And the answer is we simply don't know, right? It is possible that the need to be plausible and consistent registers differently between liars and truth tellers. But this isn't a trivial is issue, right? And I think it's an area ripe for us to investigate. We cannot assume that because truth tellers know the answers to unexpected questions, they would have an easier time answering. Even if a truth teller says, well, I remember the, the thing that happened on this topic you want to uh, ask me about. Remember that they haven't considered that you're going to ask them an unexpected question, right? And this is an example of, you know, a true teller's plight that we should be investigating. We should be investigating to provide clarity on cognitive load light detection. There's one issue I'll point to quite briefly. And, the, and that question is, well, what is an unanticipated question? Now, I've heard examples of things in specific studies about questions people mightn't anticipate. But these are just examples, right? As far as I know, there's no falsifiable theory that identifies Generally speaking, types of questions people do not anticipate and why. And this is another loophole. Any study on unanticipated questions, the way I see it, is ripe for post hoc reasoning. If you support the cognitive load uh, lie detection hypothesis, then great, the manipulation was right. If there's no support, one could easily blame the manipulation, not the cognitive load lie detection hypothesis, right? So what are the consequences of these blind spots and under specification? Well, the problem as I see it is that one cannot truly examine cognitive load lie detection, not in its current state, right? These research gaps with these justifications provide a perpetual shield for cognitive load lie detection, right? If I was to represent the world visually in your head, 
I'd say the hypothesis looks something like what I've uh, put on your screen here, if you can see my point. Say I one presented evidence to reject justificate one of the justifications, right? And by extension, cognitive load light detection. You could easily explain that rejection away in two moves, right? You could reframe the justification based on some unanswered research question and say, well, the study didn't really tackle the justification, so it doesn't tackle the hypothesis. Or one could simply concede and say, well, this justification doesn't work, but this one works, right? And so the, this hypothesis would never come under scrutiny. We would keep moving right around this and never get to the meat of the thing uh, we want to test. Now, what I did after all of this was conduct a meta-empirical review to find the justifications people cite with the most frequency. See, then we could find a bright line, something we can focus on to say, well, these are the justifications that matter when it comes to this uh, hypothesis. But what I found was that authors cite these justifications in no systematic manner. Some folks would cite one, some cite a few, some cite all seven, right? And so if you wanted to focus on something, you couldn't find it. And moreover, we don't know whether these justifications are independent assumptions or whether they're network. So even if you present evidence to reject all seven, the postdoc explanation could be, well, you didn't look at how they are related and the hypothesis itself would be shielded, right? So let's answer the most important question for today uh, before I, I end this presentation. Am I just a hater, right? I'd argue uh, passionately that I'm not. I think that it's absolutely critical to ensure that the cognitive load light detection rests on a solid foundation. And I think that if we don't do so now, sometime in the future, this hypothesis might begin to look like arousal-based uh, light detection, and we'll be right back where we left off uh, when we tried to find evidence-based recommendations for light detection. And that's my time. Uh, thanks for listening.